So as I was doing research on this case, I probably said, what the fuck? Out loud, numerous times without thinking. Probably in front of children. And you're probably going to do the same. Because this is the craziest woman I've ever covered. And the deeper I dug, I just kept pulling up more and more what the fuck moments. And the story just kept getting longer. Just to give you an example. My final drafts for these videos are usually 2,000 words. This story is over 5,000 words because I just didn't want to leave anything out for you guys. It was just too crazy to leave out. So allow me to earn that thumbs up just for the deep dive. And please comment below what part was your what the fuck moment because I love reading your comments and how else do I know that you appreciate these videos. Now let's get on with it. Scenario. So you just got married and it's your honeymoon night but you notice the peculiar quirk about your new bride that you hadn't noticed before. Now, she's definitely a flawed human being, but this was a flaw that you literally can't live with. Now, what do you do? Now, some men might go straight into denial that it's not that bad. Now, some men may stare at a picture of Jesus and just pray for the strength. Now, some men might be like this groom, get wasted from that day forward and just try to ignore it. But how the fuck do you ignore the fact that your new bride on your honeymoon nearly strangles you into the afterlife? You wake up in the middle of the night and she's on top of you, squeezing with all her strength your little throat and you are barely able to bucker off you. And the reason why? Because you were inadequate in bed. And fellas, before you giggle, start questioning your own manhood. Because this particular groom had already serviced his bride a total of three rounds. And basically fell into a coma, as any mortal man would. But she wanted to go a fourth round. She had heard her parents had consummated their love a total of five times on their honeymoon. Which made her feel a bit rejected that she was only getting three disturbing i know and that's just the tip of the iceberg of how disturbing this story is going to be welcome to true crime stories my name is killian and this is the extremely horrifying case of katherine knight October 24th, 1955. Catherine Knight is born at the Tamworth Hospital in Australia to parents Barbara Rohan and Ken Knight. Let's briefly go into the parents' history as it will be important to the foundation of Catherine's story. Barbara and Ken's love blossomed amongst the cold bodies of slain cattle in the slaughterhouse they both worked at. But this was a forbidden love because Barbara was already married to the manager of the factory named Jack Rohan, in which she had four sons with. It became quite the scandal when rumors got around, but Ken was able to win her heart, runs off with him, leaving Jack and her four boys behind. Barbara and Ken would start their lives and have four kids of their own, two boys and two twin girls, one of which being Catherine. Both parents found work in the meat industry to support their growing family. What they couldn't anticipate was how fast four kids would double to eight, because just a few short years later, Jack Rohan dies, and custody of the four boys were given to Barbara. Now suddenly, it was the Brady Bunch on steroids with 10 people under one roof. Now, being from a family of butchers wasn't all glitz and free steaks. It was laborious hard work and the family had to move around constantly as the opportunities in the meat industry dried up as new ones cropped up elsewhere. And during the times when money was tight, tensions were incredibly high. Dad would get blistering drunk and he and mom would fight. The verbal assaults, they were just foreplay. The real fights were outright physical, wrestling each other around the house while throwing punches. And Barbara was known to smash Ken's face as good as he was able to rearrange hers. But in the end, Ken would overpower his wife and violate her several times a day. 
The kids also weren't safe from the abuse. Catherine craved the attention of her mother, but received the occasional beating instead. In a family of eight other needy kids, she was just another burden. This left a scar deep within Catherine's psyche as she craved her mother's approval and attention that much more. It altered the way she approached issues in life. That violence was the problem solver and she had the shortest fuse to set it all off. One incident happened in grade school when she and her sister Joy got into an argument about whose turn it was to ride the bicycle home. Now, normal sisters would argue and maybe curse, tease at worst, maybe a shove. But Catherine pounded her sister to the pavement with punches that had weight and purpose. And this was her own twin sister, the only person she ever felt close to in her family that she was doing this to. So you could imagine what she would do to someone she didn't care about. Now, of course, this aggression that she displayed didn't make her very popular in the many different schools that she attended. She was basically the bully because of this high temperament. But despite the angry exterior, underneath still lay a sad child that struggled with low self-esteem. Her bravado towards the other kids wasn't backed up by much, except that all she knew was violence and intimidation. Her relationship with her parents, especially her mom, grew more complicated throughout the years because there were times when love and affection were shown when the times were good and she felt so happy. Then she would be smacked on the mouth and everything was shit again when things were bad. Later on in life, she would also reveal that she was afraid to go to sleep at night because certain family members would sneak into her room and she would endure S.A until the age of 11. So it may stand to reason that some wires in Catherine's brain got crossed between love, empathy, affection, joy, and sex with the violence that encompassed them. There was no one she could really turn to, always shoot away like a common housefly when she needed someone to talk to. So I can't even begin to imagine the kind of anxiety all these conflicting emotions would cause in a child before she even hit puberty. The lack of guidance pretty much forced her to make up her own playbook. And we all have triggers, things that annoy us. But I'd surely bet that Catherine Knight has way more than we do. Dealing with what looked to be depression, Catherine struggled immensely in her classes, so it's no wonder that by the age of just 15 years old, still barely able to read or write, Catherine drops out of school completely and decides to follow in the footsteps of her family and got herself a job at the abattoir to cut meat. And she loved it, excelled at it. Co-workers would say that she was maybe a bit obsessed with it as they would see her nicking the arteries of cattle just to see them bleed. But when you love your work and highly proficient at it, sometimes the higher ups will notice. She was promoted to the coveted position of meat boner, the person entrusted to cut the meat from the bones, sides, and carcasses. She was also in charge of slaughtering the livestock, where everybody was a bit off put by how much pure joy she displayed while killing the animals. With every careful cut, each clean slice of flesh gave her satisfaction. She was gifted a set of knives by the company for her excellent work, which thus began a lifelong fascination with the fine instruments of her profession, decorating her bedroom with various kinds of knives. What no one could know then that it was killing these animals that was satiating a lust for a different kind of killing. So now that you know the toxicity festering within the mind of Catherine Knight, please take it as a cautionary tale. View it as a warning. The next time you meet a charming character that draws you in with a warm smile and agreeable demeanor, take it with skepticism because that's exactly the facade Catherine displayed to get people to like her especially men. Ask the boyfriend that had to witness Catherine slit the throat of her own puppy because she was angry at him for not following her every command. Or the poor sap that barely ran out of his house with his life after having been hit upside the head with a steaming hot iron for being late 
to come home. Ask these guys if the aforementioned cautionary tale would have been some fine, fine advice to take. And now we get to David Kellett, the man that would be strangled on his honeymoon. Waking up to your new wife already trying to kill you can really set the tone for the shit show that was their marriage for an unbelievable 10 more years. How is that possible, you may ask? Well, it might make more sense if I take you back to when they first met. And I want to really emphasize, might make more sense. So after working three more years at the abattoir, Catherine is now 18 and notices a new guy named David Kellett on the slaughterhouse floor. He was introduced to her by her brother as the new kid in town that had just been hired. Catherine and David began to get chummy and she really takes a liking to him, even though she was a whole head taller than he was. You see, David reminded her of her father, a raging alcoholic that was quick to throw punches disturbing i know especially when you realize this meeting was eerily similar to the love story her parents had so one night Catherine accompanies david to a bar where david would get drunk and exchange some heated words with another a full-on drunken scuffle would ensue Catherine, having been used to this kind of thing her whole life joined in on the fight and helped david bloody a few noses completely impressed by his companion's willingness to physically harm others for him david then takes a liking to her he takes his new girlfriend home to meet his family and everything went perfect as Catherine was a sweetheart but david's sister sandy who had also liked her very much one day is caught off guard at a sudden mood change in Catherine. It was almost like flipping a switch from happy to mad when her brother David said something she didn't like. Sandy said that she towered over her short brother and began physically handling David like he was a child. Her strength was remarkable. Sandy later asked her brother, what in the world happened? And David tells her bluntly that if she ever sees Catherine mad, just stay out of her way and that if she was around knives just run so after a few months of dating david who was once this free spirit a man's man that drinks in excess and never feared a fight had now met his match but it wasn't catherine's fists that broke him she had wormed her way into his inebriated brain and now had complete dominance over him like a trained puppy so in 1974, a 19-year-old Catherine told David it was time to get married, and they got married. David was completely wasted for the majority of these events, so he didn't resist much of anything. Exactly the way she liked it. Let's just skim through the highlights of this marriage. So David is nearly choked to death on his honeymoon. Alcohol-fueled fights, disobeying Catherine fights, Catherine is suspicious fights, getting home from work late fights. And I have to tell you about one of these getting home from work late fights. So one night when David did spectacular at a darts competition, it would keep him later than expected as he was winning round after round until finally losing in the finals. When he gets home late, Catherine greets him with a frying pan to the head which fractured his skull. David bled and then fled to the neighbors where he collapsed while the police were on their way. Catherine burned all his clothes, all his shoes, anything, David. But no charges were ever filed because, well, David's balls were securely in a vice and Catherine made nice with the officers and everything was okay. After a week in the hospital, he is released and Catherine couldn't be more remorseful. Took his withered balls out for him and they had makeup sex. Catherine, now 20 years old, gets pregnant. Now let's just make sure to note that David was far from being an angel. During the time his wife was pregnant and even before, he was having numerous affairs. Catherine's suspicions were actually well-founded. On May 11th of 1976, she gives birth to Melissa Ann. Needless to say, bringing in an infant to an already tense house doesn't make things better. 
After two months, David had had enough. He sneaks out of the house in the middle of the night, jumps in the car, and drives off. He starts a new life in Queensland with the woman he was currently having an affair with. One of her biggest fears in life seemed to be playing out in the worst way. Sorrow was just a momentary prelude to the rage, and she was about to do the one unimaginable thing that mothers should never ever be capable of doing in order to hurt the father. She takes two-month-old Melissa Ann and places her in a baby carriage and takes her for a walk through the city. A few people noticed her that day because of the way she was pushing the buggy around. Catherine was purposefully jerking the carriage around as though she was pushing it on a field of stones instead of even pavements. People were so scared about her erratic behavior and were sure that at any moment she would propel that stroller into traffic. Several calls were placed to the police and they were out there in time to arrest Catherine who clearly was having a mental breakdown and brought her to the St. Elmo's Psychiatric Hospital to be analyzed for two weeks. Temporary custody of Melissa Ann was granted to Catherine's mother, Barbara. Now, Catherine was no stranger to St. Elmo's psychiatrists as she has been admitted several times for mental issues over the years. But back in those days, mental health isn't the science it is now. It was kind of a revolving door system because all they were looking for was for you to play nice, talk nice, and take some of their antidepressant pills. They would deem her recovered and send her back out to be crazy. Catherine picks up the crazy right where she left off, gets Melissa Ann back from her mother, puts her in the carriage, and again takes another but more peaceful walk through the city. Her destination was the train station where she places two-month-old Melissa Ann on the tracks just minutes before a train was due to arrive and simply walks away. Catherine notices an axe in someone's backyard, jumps the fence and steals it and goes back into town threatening people with it, swinging it wildly around her head. The police arrive soon after. She is apprehended and once again taken to the St. Elmo's Psychiatric Hospital. And of course, you're going to wonder what happens to Melissa Ann on those train tracks. So this is the feel-good section of this rather bleak story. So a local homeless man was rummaging through a nearby bin, stopped what he was doing when he heard footsteps, saw a tall, skinny lady place what looked to be a baby on the tracks. Once she leaves, he immediately goes and gathers the infant in his arms just moments before the southbound train arrives. No one has seen Melissa Ann's tiny little body except for this angel, a nameless vagrant that became a certified hero to the community that day and no longer would go nameless. He was thereafter greeted with respect as old Ted Abraham by those that came across him. So back to Catherine. After a week of ingratiating herself with the St. Elmo's team of well-trained psychiatrists, they deemed her recovered and sent her back out to be crazy. She goes straight home and immediately to her neighbor's house with a lie that her baby was really ill and needed a ride to the hospital. The lady believes her and pulls the car up to Catherine's house. The neighbor's teenage daughter went inside to see if she could help, but instead finds Catherine clutching a knife. Catherine grabs the girl as a hostage and winds up cutting the girl across the face. She gets the girl into the car, where Catherine is surprised to see the neighbor's younger son in the car also. Nevertheless, Catherine demands the mother drive to a particular address. Along the way, the young boy starts to hyperventilate, and the panicked mother starts pleading with Catherine that her boy was asthmatic and that they would need to stop right away so that he can get help and just let her son go, that there was just no need to keep him. Catherine agrees. Once the car was stopped and the boy gets out, he screams for help and everybody exits the car. With the help of gas attendees and a broom, they were able to disarm Catherine just as the police arrived. Again, she was apprehended, but this time she was admitted to the Morissette Psychiatric Hospital. Now let's see how they do. So Catherine, after ingratiating herself with the Morissette's team of well-trained psychiatrists, they deemed her recovered and sent her back out to be crazy. 
Now get ready for the story to make absolutely no fucking sense. I had to read several different sources to make sure I wasn't reading it wrong, but turns out it was true. So the address that Catherine wanted her neighbor to take her to that day was that of Florence Kellett's house, David's mother. She was gonna kill the man's mom because she wanted to hurt him as bad as humanly possible and a surefire way to get a man's attention was to kill his mama. So word of Catherine's plot to kill his daughter and his mother reaches the ears of David Kellett himself. He breaks up with his girlfriend, packs up, and moves back in with his mom in Aberdeen. Because nothing like almost losing someone you love that will make you appreciate them more, right? Not necessarily. After a long discussion together, they both agreed that they should house Catherine in his mom's house. So what the fuck am I missing here? Maybe another chance was all she needed? The strangulation and fractured skull was just a misunderstanding, was it David? Leaving your daughter on the train tracks was just a prank I guess, and let's go ahead and put the woman that tried to kill your mother as close as possible to your mother again with knives within reach. I say David. Either the alcohol has completely obliterated your brain, or St. Elmo's clearly missed a patient. Well, regardless if it makes sense to me, you, or sanity, they both start living and healing at David's mom's house. Catherine and David eventually move out to their own place. He gets a job as a truck driver, and Catherine was right back in the slaughterhouse. They seem to be making the best of it and were both on their best behaviors. Catherine reunites with her love of knives and dead animals, as both were now taking space on the walls. Catherine gets pregnant again, and in 1983, they gave Melissa Ann a little sister named Natasha Marie. So I'm gonna give you a quick, what the fuck, moment that I promise you is true and because it didn't sound real to me when I first read it. Now the day after Catherine was reunited with David, the couple and David's mother Florence went to get Melissa Ann back who was in Catherine's mother's care again, her name Barbara. When they arrived, Catherine goes into the house to get Melissa and Barbara comes outside. She goes and stands right next to David's driver's side window. David's mother was in the back seat. Now, this was only the second time Florence had met Barbara. And after what was about to happen, hopefully the last. So Barbara reaches into the car and starts choking David with all her might. Florence was petrified and didn't know what to do but scream. David himself seemed to be in a state of panic also because all he did was death grip the steering wheel as his face turned red and his veins started pulsating. Catherine, coming out to see what the screaming was about, rushes up to her mother and knocked her out cold. Barbara falls to the ground unconscious. Florence at this point is crying for her son because she came from a normal nice background. Who the hell were these people that were so violent? And why was Barbara choking David in the first place? I don't have an answer for that because the interview with Florence Kellett herself as she was recalling the story ended right after Barbara was knocked out cold. Now where were we in the story? Ah yes, Natasha Marie was just born. But she was only born out of necessity to hold on to David because he had just caught her in bed with another man. She begged and pleaded with him to give her another chance and he eventually caved. During the makeup process, Catherine convinces him to have another child. But like I said before, having a crying newborn in a tense home isn't the solution. So a short year later, by 1984, this convoluted love story came to an end again when David wakes up with a knife to his chest and an angry Catherine accusing him of having a girl in every town because that's what truckers do. He vehemently denies it all, even though he probably did. And when Catherine calms down, he goes to work. The twist here is when he gets back home, Catherine and the girls were gone. She had left him this time. 
So you would think that Catherine has a fear of abandonment because of her relationship with her parents, but psychologists that have analyzed her say that that isn't the case. She just couldn't stand people defying her. She had severe control issues. In layman's terms, she was just a stone cold bitch that had to be right and have her way. She wasn't capable of love because her children seemed to be dispensable. Her lovers just had to obey her because obviously we can see that she could leave a relationship without bloodshed as long as it was on her terms. Now get this, Catherine and her two girls moves in with her mother, yes, Barbara. So I guess knocking out your mother cold in the night household was just par for the course. You know, you pick up the old lady, dust her off, no love loss. Catherine finds work again as a butcher, but would injure her back after just a year and goes on disability. She would have a couple more relationships she would make toxic, leaving behind a few more men with PTSD. But now we get to the actual meat of the story, and I know. How in the world is in Catherine and David's story not the main course? Well, you'll see why as we welcome John Price into the Catherine Knight good one. John was born in 1955, making him and Catherine the same age of 38 when they meet in 1993. For John, it was completely sexual, but for Catherine, it was completely a full-blown relationship. Now, John was described as a terrific bloke by his friends, a very successful miner who made good money that was generous with his fortunes and an all-around nice guy. But being a nice guy with someone like Catherine is the exact wrong guy to be. Because by 1995, Price had reluctantly allowed Catherine to move into his home as she was there all the time. And like they say, that once they leave their toothbrush in your bathroom, well, things are official, buddy. But being as intense as Catherine was, she believed that John and the house belonged to her now. John was also a single parent with two kids named Rebecca and Jonathan living with him at the time and they seemed to like Catherine just fine. The situation was harmonious, he just wanted to avoid confrontation, so John, well he just let it rock. But by 1998, Catherine felt it again that it was time to get married, but no matter how nice John was, he was not going to marry her, so he told her outright that he liked things the way they were and that his attraction to her had remained physical. The nice guy way of saying that he was only in it for the sex. So now let's go ahead and meet the real Catherine Knight again. Her attitude towards John does a complete 180 and now she is venomous towards him and her every waking thought was consumed on how to hurt him because he had rejected her. Nobody rejects Catherine Knight without repercussions. And it started with something as petty as lying to John's daughter Becky that he was not her real father, that her mom slept with someone else, a complete fabrication to cause a rift in the household. But her next move would have a major impact on John's life, and that was to end his beloved career. Now John once showed Catherine a few outdated medical kits that he had stolen from work. He felt it was a rather innocuous crime as the company was going to dispose of them anyways. Catherine video records these kits and sends the tape to his boss. Now John had worked for the company for 17 years at this point. You would think that stealing these kits would be harmless, but they fired him. John, now 43 and unemployed, is livid. He kicks Catherine out immediately because it was clear that it was her in the tapes and the relationship was over. Now guys, if you haven't already guessed, Catherine was amazing in the sack. Why else did all those beaten and bloody men come back for more? Psychopaths just have this amazing way around our mortal emotions. They find out what we want and they dangle it like bait. And just like David Kellett, no matter how awful the things she did were, she found a way to get her victims to come back for more. And just a few months after they ended it, it was no different for John Price. Just a quick warning, things are about to get really graphic. Your discretion is advised. 
So John and Catherine are now back at it again. By this time, he had gotten himself another job as a miner, the situation with his daughter was resolved, and many things were swept under the rug. But all those friends that thought he was a terrific bloke no longer thought so, at least when Catherine was around, because they saw how she was making him change. They saw through her act, yet even at the risk of losing his friends, he chose to get back in bed with the devil. The honeymoon phase this time around didn't go so well. The peaceful Hunter Valley Hamlet of Aberdeen that John lived in wasn't so peaceful one night when he and Catherine had a shouting match that could be heard throughout the neighborhood, which resulted in a visit from the police. Catherine could not accept not being in complete control of John, and John this time was not budging about certain things, and one of those things was that Catherine would no longer treat his home as if it was hers. The tirades were now completely manic, to the point that in another argument, she just straight stabs John in the chest. It wasn't life-threatening, but serious enough that he kicks her out of his house, tends to his wounds, and goes straight to the magistrate to get a restraining order. The following Tuesday, he goes into work and he shows his co-workers and his boss where Catherine had stabbed him. He told him that he went to get a restraining order, but that it would take three weeks before he could even go to court which he would joke that he would probably be dead by then, that if he didn't show up to work one day, that it was Catherine. The very following night, Catherine had arranged for John's children to have a sleepover at a relative's house. After work, John went to his neighbors for dinner and drinks, and it wasn't just until before midnight did he return, a bit drunk. He showered and then went to bed. Catherine, still having a key, let herself in. It was said that she watched a few minutes of television first and then went into the bathroom, showered, and came back out in black lingerie. She went into John's room, woke him up, and they had sex. John, still drunk, just went with it and promptly fell asleep after. Catherine then pulls out a butcher knife and stabs him. Jolted awake by the pain, John gets out of bed and runs out of the bedroom, but next to him, Every step of the way was Catherine, who continued to stab him repeatedly. He was able to make it just outside the house before being dragged into the hallway. Catherine shuts the door, and John would die from his wounds at this point. She had stabbed him a total of 37 times. She then drags his body to the lounge room adjacent to the kitchen. Now a second warning for the squeamish watching, because it's about to get much worse. With John's lifeless body sprawled out in the lounge floor, all those years of working in a slaughterhouse had now led up to this moment. She walks into the kitchen to get a knife. She then meticulously skins Price's body. And she took her time too, probably savoring the process, because the coroner said that it was so cleanly, skillfully done that the skin could have been placed back on John's body. On the doorway of the kitchen, she had attached a meat hook. She takes John's skin and hangs it on that hook, and it hung there like some long flesh-colored pajamas. She enters the kitchen and starts a big pot of water on the stove and begins to cut vegetables into it and leaves it to boil. She goes back to the body and starts hacking John's head off. Once it was off, puts it in the now boiling pot and caps it. She then starts slicing off pieces of flesh and starts cooking them on a pan. She sets out two plates and prepares a few sides, such as baked potatoes, gravy, and cabbage. Once the meat was done, she places them on the plates. She writes Becky on a piece of paper and sets it next to one, and Jonathan for the other. She wanted to feed John to his children. You have two hot plates of daddy with veggies, John's head boiling on the stove, John's skin dangling on a meat hook, John's skinless, headless body laying bloody on the floor. It's said that she was proud of her work this night, and to celebrate, Catherine had also made herself a plate. She brings a fork of John's flesh to her anxious lips and starts chewing. 
but she finds the taste disagreeable, sets that plate aside, lays down next to the body, takes a handful of pills in an attempt at suicide, but all she did was fall into a deep sleep. The following morning, having taken John's warnings about his death seriously, co-workers were immediately alarmed when John, who was always first to arrive at work, was late. They rang his house, and when no one answered, they called the police right away. Police arrive at John's house on March 1st, 2000, to find Catherine still passed out at the crime scene. She is taken to the hospital, where she would spend six days recovering, claiming she had no recollection of what happened. Anyone unfortunate enough to be working that scene, or just even seeing pictures of it, will never be able to forget how sick and gruesome everything was. Catherine Knight was charged with murder the day after. In a March 4th interview with police, she says, The last time I recall was, I don't know about your dates, but when I went inside and watched a bit of TV. And again, when she was analyzed by psychiatrists, she was deemed recovered and mentally fit to go to trial. On October 2001, her trial begins and she pleads not guilty. And then, to everyone's bewilderment, changes her plea to guilty. The judge presiding was Justice O'Keefe, and to him, it was just as well, as the case was over anyways, because the evidence is undeniable. The crime is extremely vicious. By sending John's children away showed premeditation. Her past is marked with red flags, and the culprit, being deemed mentally fit, shows absolutely no remorse, that he fully believed that she would just be an ongoing menace to society, so he didn't fuck around as he was ready to do something that Australia had never done before. He was going to sentence the first woman to life in prison without the possibility of parole, adding in this impactful statement during sentencing. The last minutes of his life must have been a time of abject terror for him as they were a time of utter enjoyment for her. Catherine Knight today, in 2022, is 66 years old, and she is still rotting in the Silverwater Women's Correctional Center in New South Wales. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button and subscribe. It's these little things that can make a big difference for the channel moving forward, and I appreciate you greatly. I hope you enjoyed the story, Dad. I'll be back soon with another. <clears throat> to take. And now we get to David Kellett, the man that would be strangled. Okay, don't laugh at that. <clears throat>